Where's Fielder? He's gone to the dogs. Howdy, folks, and welcome back to the Gone to the Dogs podcast. I'm your co-host, Corey Groover, here tonight with our favorite, favorite coon hunting conversationalist, Stephen the Older. How you doing today, Steve? Hey, man, I'm good. You know, I have survived an earthquake and an eclipse of the sun, and I can still see. You know, it's like I, I, I thought today as I was standing out there flat-footed looking straight at the sun. Now, nah, I'm really kidding there, folks. I didn't do that. <laughs> but my, my dad was a pipe fitter, and he did a lot of welding. And there was the story went that there was an apprentice welder uh, that came on the job, and the old veteran kept telling him now watch that arc watch that arc and finally the apprentice said man you got to watch it yourself my eyes are killing me (laughs) (laughs) so So, you survived all that in the same week think about it man and we drove all the way from florida you know two days in the car together with my wife and we didn't harm each other (laughs) <laughs> you know, and hey, er- everything's looking up, looking up. All it might ex- be the week for you to buy a lottery ticket. Uh, yeah. I, real quickly, you know, I, I mentioned that I wanted to try to do some fly fishing while I was up here. And, of course, so, uh, a fellow podcaster there that kind of he and I started down this journey together way back with houndsman xp chris powell he told me the other day he said well i hope you catch a lot of flies while you're up there i told him i was going fly fishing you know (laughs) but (laughs) anyway the fly fishing has been a bust the water's too high too much water too just so i ran into the last the same thing last week i know last year when i was here in june so i don't know it must not be in the cards for me to catch these new jersey trout but they they probably talk funny anyway they, <laughs> they probably pop give a different sound in the pan i don't know but oh yeah you're probably right about that <laughs> how's so your what we got, yeah. so what do we got on the docket for this week what do we mm. what do we got? Well, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges of doing a weekly podcast, and some guys don't do them every week. Some, you know, go uh, bi-weekly, or some of them do a very short podcast, you know, 20 minutes in duration or whatever, and I I don't know that, you know, there's any set rule. Back in the day, I think before people got tired of listening to me, they used to say, oh, make them longer. We want them longer. And, of course, I figured that was the guys that were out there on the road all day driving a truck or or maybe sitting on equipment all day or in a warehouse on a forklift, whatever. But uh, somehow this hour to hour and a half kind of became the the standard or at least the rule of thumb for me. Uh, and to come up with something, you know, that we think will be interesting to uh, our listeners each week is uh, is a challenge. But uh, I think we're up to it. You and I uh, each, uh, you know, ha- have the ability, I guess you would call it, to kind of pick up a subject and run with it. And so that's what we're going to do tonight, I think, Corey, is talk a little bit about what uh, I would call the multi-purpose hound. Uh, and uh, how's that sound? You that think we could, good. we could, uh, as I said last week, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, you know, maybe you go the other route. But uh, what what would you? What comes to mind with you when you say a multi-purpose hound? Well, no, I think there's I think there's two different ways of looking at it. If you're looking at it in just the realm of hunting, 
then I think that that is a dog that is much like myself and is a jack of all trades and a master of none. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think, I think that there's quite a demand for dogs like that. And, and especially in today's day and age where we, we want our dogs to do more and, there are some dogs out there that can do it, right? Well, yeah, but I, you know what I what I'd like to do. What when this came to mind, I thought, well, let's break this down a little bit, you know, and let's talk about what what do we mean when we say a multi purpose dog? I guess the first thing that would come to mind is a dog that can be. Uh, well, just pick, it's chicken and the egg, but let's say the UKC has picked up on this with a, what they call the dual purpose or the dual class, dual class, I think they call it, at Autumn Oaks where a dog has to go out and win a cast, and if he wins his cast, he hunts, in the, in the process, he's hunting against dogs of his breed only or her breed only. And if they win the cast, then they get a ticket to the show the next day. And then if, you know, if they're selected uh, overall as the best dog in the show, then they're the dual champion winner at Autumn Oaks. And that's got to be a a very popular thing. Uh, Years ago, dual purpose dogs or multi-purpose dogs that actually hunted in the hunt and showed on the show in the show were fairly common back in the early days. I don't know if you remember these days or not, Corey, but you know, I always envisioned that the first bench show was probably held at a night hunt and the guys are sitting around waiting for dark 30 and somebody says, well, that's a pretty good-looking dog you got there, Joe. Flip that bale of hay over there and stand him up on that bale of hay and square <laughs> bale and see how, see how he looks. Let, let's look at him. And the other guy sat back there and said, well, my dog looks better than that. So he flipped <laughs> another bale over. And then somebody said, well, hey, here, just a minute. Take this tube of 12 and lay it between those dogs and I've got one here I think can be both of those and <laughs> and that's just the way I envision that the bench shows got started you yeah know? that's probably a fair assessment yeah and somebody has asked me and especially after I went to the AKC and I got up there in the upper echelon of dog show people the ones that run around the ring and hold their little finger up when they're holding the leash. You know, that that sort of thing. Not really. That's an exaggeration. But anyway, they said, why do you coonhound people always hold the tails on those dogs like that, you know? And the answer was, well, to show the dog, you know, to his best, um, you know, his best form, his best confirmation. He naturally carries the tail up. So when you take a picture of him, you want to see him at his best. Um, so anyway, I've gotten off on a tangent there. But no, we we basically think about dual purpose dogs or multi-purpose dogs as being dogs that show and hunt. But there's But there's a lot more to the equation than that don't you think yeah especially when you get outside of the realm of coon hounds and and how people talk about uh or use the terminology dual purpose or multi-purpose um a lot of times those sorts of people are going to be referring to dogs that are capable of running different kinds of game yeah yeah and and you know that was always a question that i got down through the years with my breed, which is probably anymore, it's not true. The, the big game dogs come in all breeds and 
several crosses of breeds. But in the plot breed, uh, years ago, when I first started out, when Noah came off the ark with the first two plot dogs, uh, <laughs> it was it was common to hunt your dogs on coon during the week and then you know when or during the fall and when the bear season came in then you took those same dogs and you went bear hunting and we did that regularly for years and years and many of the dogs that i hunted in night hunts and so forth were also hunted on bear so you know they they were dual purpose dogs that way yeah. Um, but usually it was, you kept within the realm of tree game. You know, you yeah. might use the same dog on bobcat, coon, uh, you know, bear, and occasionally, I guess, uh, hogs. But if you've ever been in the South with a dog that's never been around wild hogs, they can mess up your coon hunt real quick, <laughs> you know. And uh, but anyways, I don't know. Uh, I might have gotten off track there, but you know, generally speaking, as you said, you think about a dog being used on different kinds of game. And uh, when we think about hounds, we normally think about them being tree dogs, unless they're foxhounds or beagles our deer hounds but in our world the pond we swim in they're tree dogs but through my experience down down through the years i've learned that these hounds can be used for a lot of different jobs a oh, lot yeah. of different things you know well and and most of the time historically the idea of a multi-purpose dog or a dual-purpose dog, in the sense of uh, in the sense of being successful with different types of game and hunting different types of game, a lot of that has been the product of necessity. The being mother of that, invention, right? Yeah, exactly. And that being, uh, you know, the family homestead had a hound or a cur dog or or something to that effect, and. Uh, Gosh, the more game you could bring home with that dog, the better, regardless of what it was. Oh, yeller comes to mind, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I can remember, uh, I, I found a photo here. Oh, this was years ago. I found a photo of my, my grandfather when he was probably in his early 20s with some of our relatives, and, um, and they – at that particular point in time, they all raised beagles. They had, yeah. a, they had a nice pack of beagles that they would rabbit hunt with. But the particular photo I found was him and his uncles, and they had uh, a pair of beagles sitting in front of them there. And in each hand, everybody was holding holding a set of gray foxes. And like, yeah. And as you know, in the 50s, Fox prices were prob fox prices for fox fur was probably pretty good, right? I'd so, say probably was, yeah. <laughs> for sure. So having a beagle that would uh that would yeah. run a fox was probably not such a bad thing when you could get fifty, sixty dollars out of a single <laughs> fox. So um you know, those kinds of dogs would kind of be um refuted today, you know, for, for being trashy or whatever, but you know, that's how a lot of these these talented dogs have come to be in the past is just because of the needs of the family and the needs of the homestead. Well, yeah, the development of the hound in this country, and I've talked about it many times, the history. You know, we know they came over, you know, when the colonists settled this country, they brought hounds from England and France and Ireland. And... Uh, you know, and the whole story of the Walker Hound, how, you know, the Walker family in Kentucky liked a dog that could catch the gray fox or run it to ground. In other words, hold the fox and perhaps dig it out. 
And then the Red Fox was imported. And lo and behold, they couldn't run that Red Fox to ground. He'd run all night and, you know, wear the dogs out in the process. And so they began a, a pretty uh, diligent search for dogs that could catch a red fox. And, you know, they Im- imported dogs from Ireland particularly. And they got into a very intensive line breeding, inbreeding program. They had dogs that were born blind, uh, perhaps as a result of all that inbreeding. And then, lo and behold, this prepotent sire that somebody found in Tennessee in a deer chase, which was a, he was a foxhound, but he was a black and tan kind of saddleback foxhound that they called Tennessee Lead. And they brought him home and bred him to their bitches. And lo and behold, you know, they could catch those red foxes. So, you know, and that that's the background of the red of the Walker dog. And then you had guys that came along like Lester Nance and Raymond Motley and people like that with foxhound background on their dogs uh, that, you know, specialized on coon hunting. And lo and behold, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But, but <laughs> the uh, the multi-purpose dog was just like my father's experience in Tennessee with the cur dogs was played out all across the United States. And you know, it's pretty interesting. The the colonists that came to this country, they didn't have tree game in England in France. You know, they didn't have raccoons, fur bears that climbed trees. They had rabbits, foxes, deer. But that was about it, you know. Yeah. So they the dogs were ad- adapted to to the need, you know. So Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess if we go back, well, there's so many, you know, things, trails that we could follow here. But I guess when I thought about this, this multi-purpose dog, some of the things that hounds have been used for to me are, are pretty amazing. Uh, they've been trained to be search and rescue dogs. Uh, they've been trained to be cadaver dogs who, you know, could find dead bodies, or drowned individuals. They uh, were used uh, to track prisoners, just like a bloodhound. It was pretty, pretty interesting to me when I started going to Texas. I met a guy named Ron Houston. And a lot of people remember Ron from back in the day. And his brother, Scott Houston, is very much involved in showing Tree and Walker dogs. Excuse me here just a minute. But Ron's job in Texas at the prisons there was to manage a pack of hounds to chase down prisoners. And these weren't bloodhounds. And they just weren't dogs that were just primarily used to uh, trail the scent of a, of a escaped prisoner or a criminal. They were dogs that were bred to catch that prisoner and hold him by whatever means, <laughs> whether it was up a tree or on the ground or in the water or whatever, and they were not, they were not uh, soft about it, you know. So hounds can be trained for for virtually any job, uh, just like any other dog, I think. And, and one other example I'll give, and then I want to talk to you about your experience, Corey, but I ran into a guy through 
publication, I think it was one of the outdoor magazines or something, that uses plot hounds in Nebraska to flush pheasants. They're his, they're his spaniels, so to speak. They they trail the pheasant up and flush it for the gun. And, of course, I had beagles in Michigan, and and when I was there, we still had a few pheasants, not a lot, but we had ringneck pheasants, and uh, my beagles would run those pheasants. You could hear them when they, they would really chop on the track, and they'd just really ring that bell, man, and then all of a sudden they'd stop. And if you were close enough, you could hear that bird flush, you know, the wing beat. So the versatile hound, you know, uh, in, a min- that- in a minute, I want to go into another aspect of that, but go ahead. Well, I think you hit on a key point there, Steve. I think that um, the versatility of the dog as a whole is a pretty remarkable thing when you sit down and you start to think about it. And obviously the, all of the breeds of purebred dog that we have were developed for a very specific purpose and a specific role that they fit very well. And it's amazing to think about when you stop and you look at the coon hound per se, and you you think about the specific job that the coonhound had to fill the, ne- the this niche role in especially in American history and all the wonderful things that it's able to do that expound upon that idea or use use its use those very specific traits for a much greater good and I think that I think that that's something that we see across all breeds of dog for the most part. And I think that the coonhound isn't an exception to that. Well, I think certainly the coonhound's ability to scent trail, you know, ha- has made it um, a good choice or an, an alternate choice, I guess, for for man tracking and finding lost individuals or. Uh, you know, people with dementia or or whatever, and and uh, of course with the advent of the you know uh, GPS collars and so forth, that's all been enhanced greatly. But uh, yeah, I you know the hound to me is a very intelligent animal. They are stubborn. They like to do things their way. So they're probably not the most pliable of all the breeds to adapt to different tasks, but they do have the tools. You know, they have the rigor, they have the athleticism, they have that nose, and they do have the intelligence, you know, to differentiate between the track that they've been set down on and all these others that happen to, uh, you know, come, they come across in as they're trying to do uh, their task. Now you've had some multi-purpose or uh, uh, dogs that have done different tasks. And you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I could specifically talk about the young dog I'm hunting right now, the, the young flock female that I have right now. Um, we've we've trained her to be a coon dog first and foremost, but uh, she started herself on squirrels at a very young age, and that was something that I I did not discourage her to do, being that. I felt like it was going to aid her down the road and her and her ability to run and tree raccoons. So now fast forward to she's coming up on her second birthday here. And now she's very capable at treating squirrels and coons. And I personally find a lot more value in a dog like that than a highly specialized 
competition dog that has been broke to every type of game other than raccoons just for the simple fact that i enjoy hunting with my dogs and and being able to tree squirrels on top of being able to tree raccoons at night is is very valuable to me well i i agree uh from my standpoint and my station in life today it you know, to be able to have a dog that I could go out and tree squirrels with in the daytime and retrieve ducks with uh, on the pond and and uh, and you know tree coons with overnight and maybe pitch pitch them in the bear pack when I go up to Heath Hyatt's place in in Virginia and go bear hunting with the guys and all those things are it would be great, but. Most guys, I think, would say, well, I'd love to have that too, but I don't want the residual problems that that might cause me. And I say might because we don't I, – certainly there are dogs that you can use for more than one game, and, and it seems that they have the intelligence uh, to know when you're hunting a certain kind of game – you know, and uh, <laughs> I heard this story, uh, you know, uh, and uh, it may have been Jerry Clower that told this story, but I'm not sure. But anyway, how that we can kind of communicate with our dogs and let them know what we want to do. And, you know, I've heard the stories all my life, uh, some from within my own family, where they talk about going out on the porch of the farmhouse there in Tennessee with the twenty two rifle under your arm and whistle up the dogs and they immediately head for the woods and tree squirrels. And, uh, and on the way, if a rabbit got up, They'd run that too, you know, and circle that rabbit. But then at night, when you got out the two cell flashlight and lit up the old uh, uh, kerosene lantern, they didn't bother these other kinds of game. It was primarily possum because that was the predominant tree game. Then the occasional raccoon or maybe catch a skunk, which all translated to money. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you, I, I've told this story before, and it's, uh, I'll be brief. My dad said he would hoe corn, you know, chop the weeds out between the rows of the, a neighboring farmer's cornfield for 50 cents a day. That was from early morning to night. And he got his noon meal free, okay? 50 cents for the whole day. He could go out and catch a possum and sell its hide for 65 cents. Wow. <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, the, the, the old story I was going to tell you real quick is about the guy talking about how smart the dog was. And how you could teach him to do things, and, and these stories keep coming up. But and, and I'm going to jump off the train a, a, another minute here. My grandmother would tell my dad and his brothers, "Boys, you guys have left a shirt or a jacket or something out laying around somewhere on the place because the dogs are not here." <laughs> and they would go and look and find that dog laying on that shirt or that jacket, or whatever. And and that's how smart these dogs were. They knew that that, you know, that jacket or, or shirt didn't belong there. I don't know what the thought process the dog went through. You know, I mean, at the extreme, you say, you know, these boys are going to get in trouble. They're going to get their butts beat if... So we're going to stay here and guard this shirt till they get back. I doubt it was that deep, but that's yeah. just a, that's just an example. Okay, here's the story. The guy said the dog was so smart that he could cut a board to stretch a coon hide and show that board to the dog, 
and the dog would go and tree that size coon. Have you ever heard this story, Corey? I have not. So all he had to do was cut the board. You know, back in the old days, they just carved a board to stretch. They didn't have the wire stretchers that right. we have today. So he'd cut a certain size, the dog would go tree the coon, he'd shoot it out, and sure enough, it fit that board. So this happened several times, and and it got quite a reputation. And so he was telling the story, and he said, well, where's the dog? What happened to the dog? He said, well, my wife set the ironing board out on the front porch one day, and we haven't seen that dog since. (laughs) <laughs> that's a pretty good story <laughs> but anyway they're smart enough to to uh differentiate i guess would be the word between this well, game or that game and i can speak to that through a lot of my personal experience with both coon hounds and uh and the current feist type dogs um You know, when it comes to hunting multiple different species of game, there are some dogs that have a very good off switch. You'll hear that term thrown around quite a bit to talk about the dog's ability to go from hunting to the home, per se. But but there are dogs that transition between game species rather well. And then there are some dogs that struggle with it. I know that I've had several different cur dogs over the years that were that were well adapted to treating raccoons or squirrels if you had taken them out during the day. And sometimes if you went a little too early in the morning, those old cur dogs, they'd be trying to grub up a coon track for you rather than trying to uh, tree those squirrels that had just come down off of den trees and, and hit the ground. And that could get frustrating real quick, you know? Yeah. But but a majority of them seem to transition well. Well, I think that's the thing about, uh, we mentioned before, hunting raccoons and bears with the same dogs. And there's nothing more frustrating to a bear hunter to sit down on a cold track or whatever, and have a dog to get off that track and tree a coon, you know, in the daytime, especially in one of those northern swamps. You go out there and wade ice water up to your chin to get that dog off of a <laughs> off of a coon tree, you know. Yeah. So there are drawbacks to that sort of thing. And my dad kind of put the kibosh on that for me when I was a kid. Because my dad traveled, uh, well, worked away from home during the week, was home on weekends. But I, and I always, always wanted to be in the woods with the dog. So every opportunity that I had, I would take the dogs out after school or whatever. And I started treating squirrels with the dogs and I got uh, reprimanded <laughs> because trying to bear hunt the dogs in the daytime. And them tree squirrels was not, not, <laughs> you know. And back in those days, bear hunting was done differently. You know, you generally turned a dog loose, a, a, start, a start dog or strike dog, if you will. And you walked and you led the other dogs, you know, coupled two by two. Mm-hmm. And one hunter generally would have four dogs. And... You know, you didn't want the dog doing anything but finding a bear track. <laughs> but, you know, so. Well, you know, so, that, that reminds me of a story. Do you mind if I tell you a story real Absolutely quick? not. This, this, is, this is straight from the archives of my childhood. But uh, You heard it young, here, folks, yeah. <laughs> on Gone to the Dogs podcast. First time. When I, when I was a young boy. Uh, there was an older man that lived in our, our neighborhood just down the road from us. His name was Hayden Miller. And Hayden loved to go turkey hunting in the fall. And we've got a pretty good pretty good turkey population here in Pennsylvania. And um, 
and he was pretty old school. You know, he would he was the kind of guy that when you hunt him in the fall, uh, oftentimes the turkeys are all bunched up together in a big flock. You know, and, mm-hmm. and what a lot of hunters do in the fall is they try to locate where the flock's at, mm-hmm. and then go in and bust the birds up and scare them off, and then sit down and try to call the birds back to that location because mm-hmm. the birds will naturally want to try to come back together. Well, Hayden wanted to go turkey hunting one day and he needed, he needed a gopher to go in there and bust up a flock of turkeys and, and allow him the opportunity to take a shot at one. So he called, he called my parents and asked them if they, if he could take me turkey hunting. So I'll, they agreed and he, we set up the details and he picked me up and we went out to the spot that he had and we went turkey hunting. Well, we got to the spot and <laughs> Hayden told me, got out of the truck and Hayden said, now I just want you to walk this way. The turkeys are usually up on this ridge over here. And when you find the turkeys, I just want you to get in amongst them and start shooting and hollering and do whatever you can to bust that clock up. And whenever I hear you shoot, I'll come to you. I said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So I started marching marching down through the woods and before i knew it i was starting to look around and i was surrounded by fox squirrels <laughs> and that my little 13 year old self couldn't help help it i started putting a hurting on these fox squirrels that were just <laughs> popping out of every tree around me and i started shooting and i and i shot through shot through three or four shells you know and by that point, I could see Hayden running at full bore towards me down through the wood. And he was out of breath by the time he got to me. And he, he took one look at me and he asked me where the turkeys were. And I said, I don't, I didn't see any turkeys, but I got three fox squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. He needless was not say, impressed, right? Ne- yeah. Needless to say, Hayden never took me turkey hunting with him after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> he was a specialist, right? He, but yeah, exactly. you were the opportunist. Yes, he. <laughs> you, I don't think Hayden would appreciate a multi-purpose dog as much as I would, but uh, that's neither here nor there. So, well, I have a story uh, by a guy about a guy that's probably mu- very much like Hayden. Uh, and I hope that this story will invoke some uh, thoughts about your Norwegian elk count. Okay. Uh, Matt Radford was this gentleman's name. He lived outside my hometown, a little place called Piney View, West Virginia. I've spoken about Matt before. Very tall gentleman. He had three sons, Keith, Stephen, and Richard, and they were all fairly tall. They were all stone and brick masons by trade, and they built many of the prominent buildings around my town and all that whole area of southern West Virginia. Uh, And they were avid outdoorsmen. They deer hunted, they turkey hunted, they trout fished, uh, and but more so than the boys, I think, Matt was also a coon hunter. But his breed of choice was the Norwegian elk hound. Oh, nice. And he had a camp that was about five hours by vehicle back in the day when I was a teenager, uh, up to Pendleton County, West Virginia, a little community called Brandywine, right along near the Virginia border. The main Allegheny Mountain runs through there. I told a story on one of the first podcasts that I did about going in the back of the truck with my dad and a friend of his about that five hour drive and and it was cold and in the riding in the hay in the back of the or straw with the dogs it was like a it was like a 
five or to eight dog night instead of a three dog night. <laughs> but anyway, Matt here here's the nugget. Matt had a, a he had I think about three of these purebred Norwegian elk hounds, and they were beautiful dogs. They were big males, and they had these really beautiful coats and that bushy curled tail and those up upright ears, you know, and all. They were really, uh, and they were coon dogs. They didn't bark on track. So Matt would, after the deer season was through at the camp and the bear season was over, he would stay at camp and coon hunt. Or he would go early in the fall and coon hunt and uh, catch a lot of coons with these dogs. They didn't bark on track. Uh, I'm going to take just a short break here because I've talked myself hoarse here. I've treed too hard. Just a second. <laughs> the old man's got to wet his whistle. Yes, indeed. And that's not good old West Virginia spring water either, but it's pretty good. It comes out of a bottle that you buy at the grocery store. <clears throat> but anyway, what Matt would do is this Stinger dog. One of them he had called Stinger, and he had one named Ranger, I believe. And there, there were, as I recall, there were three of them. But anyway, Stinger was the best. And Stinger would trail these turkeys and uh, into an area, uh, and like you described, where they'd find those turkeys all bunched up. And this would be in the fall of the year. Okay. And uh, in West Virginia, we always had a fall season and a spring season. I think mostly nowadays the turkey season's all in the spring, isn't it? Virtually everywhere. Well, I think it depends on where you go. I know Pennsylvania still. I lost you, Corey. Hello? Hey, you there? Yeah, I lost you. You just went away. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, I, I guess you flew off the roost. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're going to have to edit this part out. Huh? Yeah, well, we'll just tell our good friend Colby, our producer, that about 42 minutes and 20 seconds in, we uh, we just uh, had some dead, dead air time. But anyway, what Matt would do was he'd use this dog to find these turkeys. And then he would make the dog lie down. And he would actually cover the dog over with uh, leaves. And I guess that, I don't know so much to hide him from the turkeys or just to uh, signal to him it was time to lie, to lay real still or what. But Matt knew that these turkeys would typically feed uphill. Okay. And he would ambush them as they came up, as they, you know, they were in the oaks, I'm sure, feeding on acorns more than likely. Might be wild grapes, uh, whatever turkeys eat. And uh, he killed several turkeys that way, and that was his... Uh, that was his method using the dog. So that's being pretty versatile. Yeah, you know, it's funny It's funny that you mentioned that because uh, the little all-count dog that I have here at the house, we call her Fang. She's named after, of course, the Jack London White Fang mm -hmm. uh, from the novel. Um, she has a pretty neat little trick that she does, and she specifically does it when she's playing with other dogs. And, uh, you know, we could be walking through the woods or whatever, and the other dog will get way out ahead of her running, you know, and she'll stop dead in her tracks and wait until that other dog's going to turn around to come back. And if she sees that dog coming back at a distance, she will hit the ground and she'll lay flat out like a border collie would herd and cheat. And, <laughs> and you wouldn't, I, I've lost her several times doing that where she'll lay flat out waiting for me 
to jump out at me. <laughs> I wonder if she uses that tactic to tree squirrels. You know, that's a good possibility. I'm not sure. Yeah, she could just get out there and play hide and seek, you know, and uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden, boo, I got you. <laughs> now, I'll that's... tell you one, one thing that, that I have always heard about a multi-purpose dog. And I guess this is in defense of, of those of you who would rather your dogs be specialists is there's that old saying that you can, you know, a jack of all trades and a master of none. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's one thing that I've heard um, that's a detriment to a dog like a Norwegian elk hound or an Airedale Terrier, for example, Um as far as being a multi-purpose dog is they may be able but they may not be really good at it so what yeah. are your thoughts on that oh yeah for sure and and i think that i wanted to kind of segue into this idea of can a dog be a competition dog and a pleasure dog at the same time and i think you touched on it there I think there was more that was it was more pos possible to have a competition slash pleasure dog back in the day than it is in today's in competition environment. Uh, back in the early days of night hunting, the dogs that were run in the night hunts were the pleasure dogs, the hide dogs, the dogs that the guys hunted through the coon season. And uh, then in the spring, you know, when things warmed up a bit and all, they went out and did the field trials, things like that with them. The field trials were the precursor of the night hunts and and so forth. And and it was, you know, the, the guys hunted the same dogs year round. Well, to, I would think if I have one of these fire-breathing competition dogs of today, that's always a mile and two tenths uh, on the backside of the back of beyond, as they say. And, you know, I can't take that dog pleasure hunting. I right. mean, because the pleasure in hunting that kind of dog is being in there a mile and a half away with a coon that's going to win a big pile of money. Right. It's not out there like Lindell Price and I talk about all the time when we get together about the many times that we sat in Michigan and leaned up against those big oaks and sat within their arms of those roots and listened to a dog called Trail of Coon up and tree it and then go and see one of those bushel basket size uh, boar coons up there in the tree. Uh, you know, that's pleasure hunting, I think, in, in one of its forms. So you're not going to see too much of that today with the same dog. Uh, you know, comment or thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think I think you bring up a valid point. You know, I, that makes me I, – I remember – uh, after a club meeting not all that long ago, um, a couple of us decided we wanted to bring our dogs to the meeting and we wanted to go coon hunting after the meeting. And the dogs that we were hunting, well, ev everybody's except mine, were, were dogs that have been groomed to be competition dogs. You know, they're, they're being actively hunted in competition and and yada, yada, yada. So, you know, I, the, the four of us got together and we just turned all four dogs loose together. And that was the last time we saw each other. We didn't end up hunting together because our dogs went four different cardinal directions <laughs> to tree coons. And, you know, I think that the, the biggest aspect of pleasure hunting specifically is you know, the fellowship that you get to have with, with the other hunters and being able to see the other dogs work and, and do that sort of stuff. And, um, 
you know, just talking about, you know, a dog that has been groomed to the competition hunter or whatever, you know, kind of take some of the pleasure out of it. Oh, well, there's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, I, I, that type of dog for me is an impossibility anymore because, you know, I, I'm not going to be physically, oh, I probably get, I can get to the dog. <laughs> But do I want to? No, I don't want to walk a mile and a tenth and turn around and have to walk that mile and a tenth plus another one in the opposite direction to your dog. And, all you know, that 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 at 77 years old, that ceased to be a pleasure a long time ago. Right. If every coon in the world's up the tree, I do like to watch the videos. I do like to hear the stories. I get, you know, excited about the competition. I have certain dogs that I like to root for, you know, and so forth. And speaking of which, as we're sitting here talking tonight, it is the Monday before the Tournament of Champions, which will kick off on Thursday night, just three nights from right now that's uh, that's really exciting to me and i'll be an armchair quarterback you know i'll be uh, uh <laughs> I'll, I'll be enjoying all that but no you know it I, I think back in the day it was much easier to have a, a combination or a multi-purpose pleasure and competition dog than yeah. it is today uh, well i think i think a large uh, a large part of when we're when we're looking through the scope of today's world, I think that a large part in the decision that's made as to whether someone wants to try to train a multi-purpose dog or not is, I think a lot of it is the area in which you live it is a big variable on that, and. Uh, secondly, I think it has a lot to do with, um, the amount of time you're able to invest in hunting and, you know, um, just for example, you know, I, I come from a state where as a whole, we have very well-rounded sportsmen that participate in a lot of different aspects of our hunting seasons. So the guys that deer hunt are also the guys that turkey hunt, and they're also the guys that squirrel hunt or run coyote dogs or, or whatever. So I think, and and that's because of the environment that, that we live in, being that Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania works very hard to give sportsmen opportunities in the field. Now you go to yeah. a, you go to a different state like let's use Missouri for example. You go to Missouri where the deer hunters and the turkey hunters have kind of taken over, and they run a lot of the regulations that come across these um, that come across the books and aren't as well rounded and restrict a lot of the other types of hunting that you're able to do well then you're obviously going to want a dog that's a little bit more specialized in that in that regard especially if you aren't one of those people who are constantly deer hunting or turkey hunting or whatever all right well you know one of the things uh, the advantage i see is of having a multi-purpose hound would be the guy like me now that just likes to be out in the woods, likes to go for those country drives, would enjoy having a dog like that to sit on the front seat of the vehicle, uh, to open the door and let him go out and tree a, a squirrel, um, you know, then a groundhog that you see cross the road. Uh, you know, tree a coon, um, run a rabbit, <laughs> whatever, you know. I've just always been the guy that loved to hunt, but it had to be with a dog. I've yeah. never gotten excited about deer hunting. I have gone deer hunting with hounds, and that was exciting. I enjoyed it. 
Uh, but I always have been a dog hunter my whole life. And, it, you know, I had the opportunities to to hunt other things. And I did squirrel hunt. I did a lot of still hunting as a boy. I was like you with those fox squirrels. I would have been right with you, brother. I would have been right in there. <laughs> and uh, But, uh, you know, that, that multipurpose dog. I, what really intrigued me, we, we spoke of this a, a, a few minutes ago, Corey, uh, before we uh, began this uh, podcast. When I was at UKC, we had the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association uh, come to UKC because they wanted to develop some events for their dogs. And those dogs just totally intrigued me. They were uh, Drothers, or the German... uh, wire haired pointer. They were like a German short hair, but they were had that bushy face, uh, most of them. Uh, but they used them for everything. They used them. Uh, the one guy that really got my attention when he talked about uh, grouse hunting in West Virginia in a place where we used to bear hunt, Kate's Mountain near White Sulphur Springs, and the dog treat a bobcat while they were on that grouse hunt. Well, and I thought, wow, now that's a cool dog right there, <laughs> you know. Well, and that brings up a good point, Steve, because um, historically the Germans uh, really put an emphasis on a multi-purpose type dog when they were developing a lot of their hunting breeds. And yeah. a lot of the attributes that those breeds share in common were for that purpose, for making them well-rounded dogs for the field and i guess i guess if i'm grasping at straws i guess you could make an argument that that's why the plot is such a versatile breed today is because of its german ancestry to a certain extent couldn't wouldn't you say that well it could be and we can you know that that's an uh, an old argument you know just how close do the plots that we have today trace back to those German roots. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of water uh, added to the soup, you know, you know, all those years. But yes, but I would say the philosophy of those, uh, uh, those stern uh, German immigrants, the Plot family being one of them, uh, had you know naturally their ways and their desires and 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 their heritage uh, reflected in the dogs they hunted. I, I'm sure that's true, and uh, uh, yeah. And I was always proud of the fact, as I was a kid growing up with this breed. You know, everybody. You know, families tend to pick different breeds. Uh, but I was always very, very proud that my dad had selected the plot breed as his breed of choice just because of that history and because of that connection. And then I was, you know, rewarded along the way when the the state of North Carolina made the plot the official state dog. You know, yeah. and I and I was fortunate to participate in the ceremony. Uh, when a highway marker at Hazel Creek there uh, near the uh, John Plot's uh, home, uh, or maybe Henry Plot's home, I don't know. Anyway, it's on Plot Creek. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that, that was always a, a lot of pride to be gathered, uh, you know, enjoyed by that fact. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's getting off the subject, but... Um, yeah, the dogs were, I called them the utility dogs of the Southern Appalachians, the old yeller type dog uh, that guarded the sheep in the daytime, babysat the kids while mom was hoeing in the garden or, or picking beans, um, you know, drove uh, the coyotes and wild game away from the the homestead and and then when you picked up the gun, they'd go to the woods and 
tree or run or, um, or bay, whatever game animal you happen to be after, you know. And I mean, but but the dogs were so much more a tool, you know, to those people. Uh, everybody had dogs, but they didn't just keep them so they have something to feed. Yeah. <laughs> you know. They had to earn their keep. That is right. Absolutely they did. Well, you know, we've kind of shined that tree, I think, on the multipurpose dog. I don't know if we've solved or, or any uh, questions or whatever that's out there, but hounds certainly can be used for a lot of different purposes. Um, and it's just like when you get got back to talking about the competition hound and all, and those, you know, you're not going to enjoy a highly bred Kentucky thoroughbred as the as you're riding a horse around the farm around the <laughs> estate you know uh, those some of us do- are taking the mule for a stroll around the farm <laughs> that's right <laughs> one of my first coon hunts I wrote about in my book the, you know the musky smell of mules I remember that first hunt with my dad and his friend and you know on my grandpa's mules using feed sacks for our our blanket our saddle blanket you know we didn't have a saddle we just put the feed sack on the mule and had a bridle and went coon hunting you know but uh well and that would probably be a good discussion point for uh the coon hunting conversations facebook page Maybe we can pose that question to our viewers here on the podcast and see what they have to say about multi-purpose dogs and and what they're currently using their coon hounds for, other than yeah. just rat coon hunting. Sure, absolutely, I agree. That's a great idea. Well, last week we were talking about the various locations for the Tournament of Champions region region hunts and we mentioned arkansas and there was a gentleman's name from i believe it was we we mentioned what was it convoy or con conro what was the town that we mentioned there in arkansas i believe it was con not convoy conway conway like twitty hello darling yeah, yeah okay the guy I was trying to think of from there, and he was always at those blue tick hunts uh, attended in, in Arkansas, and a great guy. And I haven't heard anything from him in a long time. If somebody could tell me, let me know, is Rock Parish still around? Is he still in that part of the country? And is he still following those blue dogs? And he was a good, uh, uh, solid guy. I really always enjoyed talking to him. So we started talking about that, and I finally came up with the with Rock's name, and we talked about uh, Dwayne Johnson, who is not a coon hunter as far as I know, being the Rock. And then you told me there was a Rock Johnson. Yes, from Elberton, Georgia, I believe. Elberton, Georgia. Yes, that's where... Uh, um, the famous do-over of the UKC World Championship was held. Yes, sir. Yeah. And another rock, I guess you could call this rock that comes to mind, is a dog named Rocky. Does that ring any bells to you, Corey? Oh, yeah. That was the name of the first coon dog I ever trained. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Well, never mind the one I was talking about. I was talking about the, oh, I'm I'm not going to give you the year. You were pretty good on those years. This one's name was Grand Knight Champion Smith's Hard Time Rocky. Do you know what Hard Time Rocky did? I believe that Hard Time Rocky won the Purina race, and I believe he won it twice. Mm, I don't remember him winning it twice. Okay. But I do. You are correct that he won it. Okay. Do you remember what year? I'm going to say 1991. You're very close. Oh, man. But no cigar. (laughs) 
he won it the year that you correctly answered that Kansas Sizzling Heat won the UKC World Hunt. Rocky won it at, uh, he won it in 1988. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, and that was a very nice celebration with Richard Smith and his wife and his son was there and uh, we had a wonderful time. We had so much fun with those Purina banquets back in the day. Oh my gosh. So, I, I've seen lots of historical pictures from those, especially down in the UKC archives. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, all of us like to look back on the times that we enjoyed in life and think that they were the best. I'm sure that the guys, uh, somebody this weekend is going to have a big, big day when they take home that $50,000 check. And, uh, uh that, uh, UKC will be running the coverage on that. Of course, you won't be a, you won't be hearing this until the Monday following that. So it'll be old news, but I'm sure we'll be talking about it then. But uh, well, Corey, I think we've just about shined the tree for tonight. We've got an hour and five minutes uh, of somebody's time out there that they'll never get back. As my friend Billy Dwyer said, he's been listening to podcasts lately, and he's he hasn't been real happy. He's he's he says they're just not as much fun as they used to be. Well, we're trying, Billy, and uh, for all of you out there, we want to thank you so much for listening. Uh, our podcasts are doing extremely well in terms of the numbers of downloads that we're receiving each week. And uh, we do want to always thank our good friends at W Hunting Supply for providing the opportunity for us to come to you each week with the Gone to the Dogs podcast. If you need anything in the way of hunting equipment for yourself or your hounds, apparel, great T-shirts, hats, uh, all the customer support you need for those electronics that we just can't do without nowadays, uh, Double U Hunting Supply. You'll be glad that you contacted Buddy and Jason and all the folks out there. Corey, what have you to say as we, uh, you know, uh, spit on the fire and call the dogs? Whew, I don't have much to say. I say gather them up and let's go. <laughs> it's about time dark 30s approaching here on the east coast of the United States of America. We survived the eclipse today. Uh, the world did not end as, yeah. as I expected because uh, that book that I uh, like to refer to as my uh, road map for my life, the Bible says no man knows the hour and the time. So uh, we're not going to worry about eclipses. And uh, I did also survive an earthquake this week. Hey, that was pretty neat. 4.8 on the Richter scale. And the epicenter was only 22 miles from where I am sitting right now. And, man, that was kind of a cool ride. I was in here working in the office, working on uh, the summary for last week's podcast. And all of a sudden, the desk started shaking, the windows started rattling, and I thought I was back in Japan. When I was there in the 70s, <laughs> we had those earthquakes constantly over there. But this was a good one, 4.8. It uh, They felt it over in Yankee Stadium. They were getting ready for, for a ball game over there, I think. So... so what you're saying is, is you're shaken, not stirred. Right? That, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. If you've never been in one, as Miss Ella had not, uh, it uh, it visually shook her. <laughs> she was uh, not happy about it at all. But uh, all was good. You know, an amazing thing about that, it really didn't cause any damage. Maybe uh, some mild damage right, you know, at the center. But uh, the whole ground just shakes. 
People came out in the uh, in the street, and an elderly couple across the street said, "I thought it was a big truck going by." I said, "Friend, that was an earthquake. Trust me, I've been through many of them." Ooh, man. So anyway, how would that be? You know, when you <laughs> walked in about the time you walked into the tree, and you threw your light up in the tree, and all of a sudden the whole the whole landscape started shaking what would you do well i uh i would put my head between my legs and kiss my butt goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes well folks we do appreciate you so much for listening in and uh, one more week and uh it's been our pleasure to be with you and hope that you're having a great week with your family that you're going to be hearing this on a monday i hope the week ahead is just all that you hope it will be hope that dog of yours finally quits being a bonehead and straightens out and does what you know he's capable of doing so until next time for Corey groover this is steve fielder saying if you miss us You know where we are. We're gone to the dogs. See you, everybody.